Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next session. Um, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into this uh, material. And thank you very much for the organizers for, for inviting me along today. Um, so a little bit about me is customary at the beginning, but I won't hang along, uh, hang around. I'm very easy to find social media, uh, LinkedIn being my, my favorite. Um, and poor OPSEC, I appreciate, but um, I have two things I live for. One is cybersecurity from a defender's point of view, and the other one is my family. So I'd just like to pop in a little, a little shot there of uh, life at home, because there is life beyond the noughts and ones that live inside your computer. Um, like I said, very easy to find on, uh, on social media. LinkedIn in particular, and following this, anyone wants to, to continue the conversation or stay connected, um, that is uh, where to find my profile. So I also, um, I also tried to start a meetup at the beginning of this year with uh, the interesting title uh, that sometimes gets abbreviated of where's the F in SecOps. <laughs> um, but we started that in January, COVID creeping up February, March, everyone sent home. Um, so we moved to Telegram. For those of you who aren't very well aware of uh, Telegram, Telegram is, uh, can be considered like a WhatsApp for the hacking community. Uh, it does many things, but that's where um, the chat continues there if you want to, to get involved. So what a title. Now, where did that title come from? Um, I, it's something, it, it's evolved over time, but if you, it actually was taken from quoting myself in my LinkedIn profile, which uh, I'm not sure what the psychologist would say about quoting yourself in a public profile, but quote, that reminded me of this reference to LinkedIn profiles, um, which if you hadn't come across it, I thought I'd just slip it in at the beginning in the introduction. Um, and it's, a LinkedIn, very powerful, but can have some uh, entertaining profiles out there. So the inspiration for that title and the, the quote, um, where did that come from? I'll cover that quickly and then we get stuck into the material. So it came from three separate places. It sort of evolved over time. One very important one that uh, we'll touch on later, the, the classic now, your threat model is not my threat model. Um, so that was sort of the mindset that set this set us on the road to coming up with this title. If you don't know Kelly Shortridge, I would encourage you to look, look her up and have a look at some of the presentations she's done. She does the most amazing slide decks to go with a really creative presentations, really smart InfoSec professional and this particular piece um, also kept us on the journey to coming up with this title and then the final thing October last year so just over a year ago um, the Thinkst keynote address at Virus Bulletin you get the security products we get the security products we deserve really really interesting piece of research that I was tipped off to just before it went live and it was at that point that I realized I could start saying out loud what I've been thinking, which gets this talk. You get the cybersecurity you deserve. And what does that look like now? Now, I was a little bit worried that this could become a career limiting moment, being outspoken, putting your head above the parapet, but I did it anyway. So again, I don't know what that says from a psychology point of view, but to make sure that it could be labeled a career limiting moment, I thought I'd squeeze in a quote from Malcolm Tucker. Um, it doesn't have any cybersecurity reference. I just find it sometimes really appropriate. Some of the situations we, we get ourselves in, some of the, um, in the fog of war, in the heat of an incident, you might be thinking what Malcolm Tucker voiced. And he said, I've got that on a tea towel. So someone made a tea towel. Um, if you look up the Malcolm Tucker Tuck Shop, you'll find the tea towel. Quick disclaimer, as we come to the end of this uh, little introduction, just to give you a flavor of how I think. Um, yep, 
everything here is my personal opinion. It's not uh, connected with, it's not meant to represent any of the thoughts inside any of my current or previous companies and take everything with, like it says, the appropriate pinch of salt. But even those words came from uh, Martin O'Neill. So a quick thank you, because um, ever since he, he showed me some of this, um, I've uh, used it many occasions. So this, this idea of you get the security you deserve um, is connected with, there's a lot of things that people have been in the industry for a while know are wrong, but seem to put up with. So I, I went out to some of the many groups I'm involved with, um, hacking groups, defending groups, CISO groups, uh, CIO groups, and I asked them for some of the things that they think are wrong. Think one of those things that are wrong that we're not doing enough about it. And so I popped a few of them up here and we'll get to cover some of those because it's, it's get, speaking out about not getting caught up in the propaganda is really the essence of what this, this uh, session is about. Um, if you haven't removed local admin rights from your general population, you deserve everything you get. It's kind of right. This talk is not going to win me any friends. <laughs> it's really about getting people to think about doing things better for the sake of doing things better. Um, allowing admin users email and web access. Um, the, the idea that DLP will stop a leak. The idea that AV is, is dead and you have to have the next version next gen this, XD this. Um, the idea that anything less than perfection is just not good enough. It, it, that competes with the idea of the, the, the camping in the woods being chased by a bear analogy. You know, someone stops to book on some trainers because all he has to do is outrun the person he's with. That, um, that sort of parallel analogy and uh, that but in security we seem to strive for really high 80 90 100 percent perfection is what we're aiming for at the expense of getting started very often um i have experienced it recently in a, a couple of places i was helping out where no one wanted to start there was no idea of continuous improvement. No one wanted to start until they could see the whole picture, until they had 100% of the data. No one wanted to change anything to make themselves a little bit better because they, they wanted the, the perfect roadmap and then they would set off. And that is an all too common story. Um, there's, if, you, if you read the, the press and it's not about a solution, rebranding a solution, EDR, XDR, EPP, as it says over there, um, it might be about all you need is penetration testing. Um, and then that had to evolve into something else. So now all you need is breach simulation or all you need is red team. Um, and you can do it all by yourself. You know, you can read some magazines, you can listen to some vendor pitches, and then you know what you're doing. There needs to be more getting out there and talking to your peers and sharing. Um, maybe not as open and public as this for sharing your inner thoughts, um, but I've chosen to do it anyway. But it didn't stop there. Here we go. Some of the classic things that went into these various, time, various times I asked, um, what's wrong with the industry? It's always the Russians, except when it's the Chinese. Anyone who works in trying to decipher um, cyber you know, threat intel, um, we'll get bombarded with that when you first get into it. Once you've been around for a bit, you can uh, work out what might be going on. We don't need that. We're ISO certified. Um, now, there's a lot of strength and comfort that comes from the various ISO certifications, but they, they're usually about a management standard, especially the 27,001 and the 9,001 and 40,001. They're about a management standard and a quality and a um, they're not, they don't dictate technically what you will do and whether it's the right thing for you. 
Um, it can be very misused uh, heading for ISO certified. Um, red team became purple team. Sometimes it becomes black team. You know, it, again, it's back to marketing and, and propaganda. Someone, yes, there is, so there is good out there and it is useful. And if you're in and if that's what you need, go out and get someone to help you with it. But uh, it's, it's a long way down the road after you've got the foundations right. There's not enough working on the foundations um, goes on, in, uh, I feel. The classic, buy this appliance. You know, this, this is, an, 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 and, and do the beauty pageant or the, the, the bake off with all the appliances that play in the same space. Um, whether it be from a certain quadrant of a certain document from a certain analyst firm. Um, the idea that you, um, an appliance will solve it or technology is the answer. Then people fight back with, oh, it's PPT and T comes after P and P. It's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> um, one that I continue to find very frustrating is this comment here on the, the right of the slides as I'm showing them, honeypots are easy for attackers to spot and are risky to deploy. I have heard this so many times, but it completely goes against my experience of honeypots and my experience of talking to other people who have got real value from honeypots. Um, I, I join a lot of behind closed doors uh, chats where people open up and say what works and what doesn't. And honeypots are, when they're done, done right and for the right reasons, are very high fidelity alerts. You know, Either there's a broken machine or there's someone who shouldn't be on there. Both of them need fixing. Um, so the idea that they can be taken over by an attacker or avoided by an attacker, yes, those are valid concerns, but they're not the thing that should stop you starting, getting started on the journey in that direction. Then the classic, I accept the risk. Now there is a time and place for accepting risks. There's also a time and place for recording risks, um, a threat modeling, risk assessments, risk registers. Um, but I accept the risk. Do the people saying that and recording that actually know what they're getting themselves in for? Because things very rarely go catastrophically wrong, or they did before the rise of the hands on keys um, ransomware gangs, things very rarely went catastrophically wrong. I mean, the NotPetya um, cyber weapon might uh, make some people think that's, that's not the case. But the, um, the accepting the risk and just park it somewhere and move on, if you're lucky, you get away with it, but it's certainly not the way to do information security management or cyber defense. It reminds me of if you, those who know it, would probably go back and watch it again. <laughs> Those who don't know it, I would encourage you to check out um, the host unknown uh, posting on YouTube, a very, very smart um, musical video around the topic of accepting the risk. Now, quick, quick bonus page slipped in in white instead of black. Um, with, so the quote up there, Skills I've acquired over a long career, skills that make me a nightmare to believers in infosec sales and marketing is um, paraphrasing taken, of course. But this book, How to Lie with Statistics and the various re republishing and um, coursework and takeoffs of it, um, incredibly powerful text on the way people use numbers to get their message in front of you. So you don't need to worry about rigged elections or being brainwashed by vendor Kool-Aid. Um, you could look at, uh, if you review this, if you um, find, find a PDF copy, um, buy, buy yourself a copy, uh, get stuck into it, or just look at what people have said about it or examples people have taken from it. It's a really powerful text on using numbers to, to get, get people to see things your way, used all the time. Everything, every piece of marketing along as your email 
inbox, if you stop and think, why did they want me to read that number? What importance did they uh, want me to take from this number or that number or that pie chart or that set of bar graphs? This will really help you get under the covers. And um, so just quickly, whilst we're on marketing, return to this. When I couldn't remember where this image was from, I put a few words in that, um, <laughs> that search bar that it has become a verb, I think. So I Googled which of these are Pokemon and which of these are security tools, because I couldn't quite remember the context where that came from. And in the ads at the top, I've highlighted two things that um, come up in these discussions of what's wrong with the industry. So spotting the hack before the hack, you know, preemptive. <laughs> it's a bit minority report. But you, it's supposed to get you to click on that and think, how can I be protected? Because I know who's going to attack me before they know who's going to attack me. That kind of imagery in your head. And humans are the weakest link. Now, people are fairly split over humans are the weakest link, but I fall on the side of stop saying it. It's not the humans. <laughs> it's the architects, the solutions architects. Um, it's the security architects it's the not investing enough in prevention combined with the education piece the education piece is very very important raise the bar within the company you're protecting with some smart education something that's helpful timely nudges them into a, a, a safer way of dealing with uh, email web voicemail um, cloud login looking links and things. Help them along with their education, but stop calling them the weakest link is the side of the argument that I fall on. We're ISO certified. Now I have seen, and this is the raw data from the ISO survey. I have seen uh, material produced that says, you know, this country is safer than that country. And it's often you know, Japan's at the top because it has more um, ISO certification. It brings me back to what I said when I first saw this title. It's, it's a management standard. And, it, and as with most certifications, be careful of the scope because the less scrupulous people who have targets of achieving things can, can gain the scope. So most certifications with PCI being one of the hardest, they can be gained in terms of you, you can pass with, without you know, really getting stuck into maintaining it to the letter of the law. And another thing about uh, certifications to a standard or against a framework is Often people see that as the end game, where it should really be the baseline. It should be where you've raised your foundation controls to. They're, they're running smoothly, continuous improvement, checking up on them. It should be the foundations that you can stand up the next level of improvement on. They shouldn't be the end game, which they very much are often when you're trying to get the certificate to, to hang on the wall. Remember, I said these are my personal opinions and I was worried about putting my head up above the parapet and it might be a career limiting moment. This is just how I feel about this subject right now. And this is very timely. Someone shared this with me um, just a few days ago. So I thought ah, it, it, it's a, it hits the target with um, some of the things that I disagree with very strongly. And that is you know, the admin rights you have in a machine. Um, there is lots of arguments in lots of organizations about um, who needs admin rights. And personally, I don't think anyone does. <laughs> but um, in, the, in the end desktop environment, I really don't think anyone does. But people hang on to it people's permissions creep, people demand it, people say software doesn't work without it, and rather investigate how to make that software work without giving them these rights, they get the rights. It's all about closing tickets and moving on. Again, all these personal opinions, but based on many, many years of experience. So this is a particular bugbear of mine, just one of the many that will come up in this session. And um, I have worked places where local admin rights have been removed from everyone outside of second line IT. Um, so I know it can be done. 
thing there's no there's nothing new in infosec nothing new under the sun in infosec i heard someone say to me a few weeks back DevSecOps and shift left is really really popular at the moment you know summer 2020 it's really popular um people were waiting for um more things to come out from the author of the the phoenix project but many if we go back if we go back to um visible ops security this is how to get security in around itil and devopsec um that's 2009 on the left and 2012 on the right these ideas have been discussed in public and written about for a very long time considering the speed that fashions change at the moment you know what we were doing in 2016 is very different to what we'll do in 2021 but this is a book from 2009 and a, uh, a sh slide share link from from 2012 so there really is nothing new under the infosec sun now another bugbear of mine and this uh, i think this change is slowed down by um regulators and external auditors um i think the external auditors because you know the evidence being discussed for four or five years now are getting on board with changing but the um the password complexity rules the changing of the password every 60 days 20 years ago um 20 years ago this this was really appropriate um but it's not anymore the way the complexities the number of passwords we've got the password what or other things can be put in place. And I have passwords I haven't changed in 17 or 18 years. Now, in order that we have some time at the end, I'm going to step the pace up a bit. I have enough material to go on all afternoon, but that's not fair on you or uh, anyone else. So um, when it comes to the, the password guidance, do find out about the new ways of looking at things. And the NCSC's um, pages on three random words and the correct horse battery staple a reference to an XC, xkcd cartoon um, i i actually put that in some of my security awareness tr training to encourage people to go along and see if they could use it to help them get a password now five questions for the board if you cannot answer this in language that a risk director a financial director a ceo would um, expect to digest but knowing that you're doing it properly from a technical point of view and um, then you will get the security you deserve so this is the five questions from the ncsc it's part of the board toolkit 2018 was the last time this was updated but it's been around a lot longer so it goes back to about 2040 the actual work with the nsa top 10 um talking about how to keep people off your networks 10 steps if you put that in your tactical technical security program um you you would raise the bar so that it was a little bit more than the trip hazard more likely to take someone's head off if you raise the bar by doing all of this now, I, I know it's from a lot earlier than 2016 because um, Rob Joyce, who was at the end of the tactical, um, I forget what the A is, but <laughs> the, um, the NSA hacking team's chief was Rob Joyce. And in 2016, he went to Usenix to talk about that, that paper. If you want an even bigger um, list of technical things that have been scored with how difficult they are to get in and how much they help you. I'd go with what's been rebranded the ACSC, the uh, Strategies to Mitigate Cybersecurity Incidents. Um, you should be able to tackle all of that in, in, a, in an order that, um, that they give. Uh, not everything is right for everyone, but just know about it, digest it, try and use it. This isn't ISO 27001. This isn't cyber essentials. This isn't the top 20 critical controls. This is stuff that really saves your bacon. Ah, oh, automation, so hot right now. Automation has been around. Look at that. Fail to bans about, I think, came around 2007. Might have been a lot earlier, but that's, uh, that's when they archive.org started collecting their site. And OSEC, I know there was a book in 2008 for OSEC that talked about active response. So having a security alert do something automatic for you has been an idea that's been around for a long time, but it's just really fashionable right now. Always like to include a few. 
um, a few jokes if I can. Um, and if you don't see that that is a joke, then I think you're working too hard. <laughs> if you think you don't have any spare time, then um, I think you need to get something else in your life. But uh, I do like it a lot because all security operations staff are usually really passionate about staying to get the job done. All the ones I've worked with have. Um, I love security operations side of our business. I really do. Now, speak the language of the business and a risk-based approach. You hear that talked about loads, but no one, it's very rare someone says, and here's, here's a shortcut to how to do it well. What I would like to say is if you spend some time looking at the MITRE attack material, it's becoming, it's very mature, it's developing a lot, um, it's doing well. Um, if you have a look at that, and if you also have a look at the fair approach to risk management, you know, I first heard about this in a very early version of the PCI DSS, chapter 12, require, requirement 12, not chapter, um, talks about having to have a risk register, and it says there are some frameworks you might like to use, ISO 27005, uh, Octave, um, and FAIR. And of all the different things I've worked with, FAIR is by far be my favorite. And I've had it recommended by a lot of people that I really respect. Who, um, and if you combine MITRE ATT&CK, um, which groups go after which industries, um, <laughs> how mature they are, how successful they are. If you combine that with a fair approach um, to adjusting your, your quantitative approach to, to, to risk um, by uh, capability of attack and um, uh, the effectiveness of your controls, which it does, you will end up with a defensible position that you can explain to CEOs, CFOs, you know, the business leaders, um, and that is, after all that ranting about what I and my peers don't like in the industry, this is the nugget I want to leave you with. You should look at MITRE, you should look at FAIR, and there are, you don't, uh, there are, you don't have to be a cost associated with either of them, and you should build yourself a defensible position um, in terms of describing risk reduction. Time is precious. Thank you for yours. I wanted to um, end in good time. I, I could talk about this material for hours on end. And if it was a bit more um, two way, see the whites of your eyes, you know, uh, a lecture theater, a dinner table, then we could debate all afternoon. But um, these, these times of these modern <laughs> Zoom broadcast formats, uh, I think that'll leave us with a, a few moments to capture some, some questions. And here we have, uh, hi Siobhan. Hi James, thanks, thanks so much for that presentation. Loving the uh, hard hitting messages that have gone out there. And um, definitely some activity in the chat as well, which has been fantastic. People really engaged with the session. And um, we did have um, a couple of questions that have come in. The first two, fairly similar, although the second one's got a slightly um, more specific slant to it. But, but generally, um, and this, I suppose, is kind of a summation of, of what you've just spoken to us about. What would be the most important security issue to tackle right now? The follow up to that was specifically for a medium sized company. I would say um, how well you're prepared for a hands on keys ransomware crime gang getting in and trashing um, things you really rely on. Um, so as much as NotPetya was a cyber warfare collateral damage type thing, um, the classic example is Maersk, and it took out their Active Directory. Um, and they realized that all their encryption keys were in an Active Directory, lots of systems that were linked to systems depended on Active Directory, bringing servers out of backup depended on it. So as much as that is you know, for Windows-based offices, and we're not all like that, we might have Macs, we might have G Suites, I would say, how well do you know you would respond if everything went wrong because you had a ransomware ganging? And, and also factor in the new trend of stealing data and blackmailing you with it. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks for that response. Okay, well, that's all we've got time for today. So I'm gonna have to wrap up now. Um, our next session starts in five minutes. So um, 
any of our delegates watching, please head over to the agenda to click through to the next session, our penultimate session of the day. And James, just last thing today, thank you very much for today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and letting me uh, speak my mind. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye.